The first topic is management assertions or also known as management representations. Assertions are implied or expressed representations by management about classes of transactions and the related accounts in the financial statements. Unless otherwise disclosed in the financial statements, management also asserts that the cash was unrestricted and available for normal use. Similar assertions exist for each asset, liability, owner's equity, revenue and expense item in the financial statements. These assertions apply to both classes of transactions and account balances. Management assertions or representations are directly related to approved accounting standards. Auditors must therefore understand the assertions to do adequate audits. ISA 500 Audit Evidence classifies assertions into seven broad categories, which is existence, rights and obligations, occurrence, completeness, valuation, measurement and presentation and disclosure. The first one is assertions about existence. Assertions about existence deal with whether assets, obligations, and equities included in the balance sheet actually existed in the balance sheet debt. The second one is assertions about rights and obligations. These management assertions deal with whether assets are the rights of the entity and liabilities are the obligations of the entity at a given debt. For example, management asserts that assets are owned by the company or that amounts capitalized for leases in the balance sheet represent cost of the entity's rights to lease property and that the corresponding lease liability represents an obligation of the entity. The third one is assertions about completeness. This management assertion states that all transactions and accounts that should be presented in the financial statements are included. For instance, management asserts that all sales of goods and services are recorded and included in the financial statements. Similarly, management asserts that loans payable in the balance sheet include all such obligations of the entity. The completeness assertion deals with matters opposite from those of the existence or occurrence assertion. The completeness assertion is concerned with the possibility of omitting items from the balance sheet that should have been included, whereas the existence or occurrence assertion is concerned with inclusion of amounts that should not have been included. Thus, recording a sale that did not take place will be a The fourth assertion is the assertions about valuation. These assertions deal with whether asset, liability, equity, revenue, and expense accounts have been included in the financial statements at appropriate amounts. For example, management asserts that trade accounts receivable included in the balance sheet are stated at net realizable value. The next one is assertions about occurrence. Assertions about occurrence concern whether recorded transactions included in the financial statements actually occurred during the accounting period. Assertions about measurement deal with whether a transaction or event is recorded at the proper amount and revenue and expense is allocated to the proper period. For example, management asserts that property is recorded at historical cost and that such cost is systematically allocated to appropriate accounting periods through depreciation. The last one is assertions about presentation and disclosure. These assertions deal with whether components of the financial statements are properly combined or separate, described, and disclosed. For example, management asserts that obligations classified as long-term liabilities in the balance sheet will not mature within one year. Similarly, 
management asserts that amount presented as extra income in the profit and loss account are properly classified and described. A distinction must be made between general transaction-related audit objective and specific transaction-related audit objective for each class of transaction. General transaction-related audit objective. The first objective is existence. This means recorded transaction exists. This objective deals with whether recorded transaction have actually occurred. Inclusion of a cell in the sales journal when no sale occurred violates the existing objective. The objective in the auditor's counterpart to the management assertion of existence of occurrence. Next objective is completeness. The existing transactions are recorded. This objective deals with whether all transactions that should be included in the journals have actually been included. Failure to include a cell in the sales journal and general budget when a cell occur occurred violates the completeness objective. The objective is the counterpart to the management assertion of completeness. The third objective is accuracy. People transaction are stated at the correct amounts. This objective deals with the accuracy of information for accounting transaction. For sales transaction, there would be a violation of the accuracy objective if the quantity of goods shipped was different from the quantity held, the wrong selling price was used for buying, extension or adding errors occurred in buying, or the wrong amount was included in the sales journal. Accuracy is one part of the violations or allocation session. Next objective is classification. Transaction included in the client's journals are properly classified. Examples of misclassification for sales are including cash sales or credit sales, recording a sale of operating fixed asset as revenue, and multi-classifying commercial sales as residential sales. Classification is also a part of the valuation or allocation session. Next objective is timing. Transactions are recorded on the correct dates. A timing error occurs if transactions are not recorded on the dates the transaction took place. A sales transaction, for example, should be recorded on the date of shipment. Timing is also part of the valuation or allocation session. Next objective is posting and summarization. Recorded transactions are properly included in the master fields and are correctly summarized. This objective deals with the accuracy of the transfer of information from recorded transaction in journals to subsidiary records and the general ledger. For example, if a sales transaction is recorded in the wrong customer record or at the wrong amount in the master file, it is a violation of this objective. Posting and summarization is also part of the valuation or allocation session. Next is specific transaction related audit objective. The following are specific transaction related audit objective applied to the audit of cash disbursement transaction, management assessions about classes of transaction, and general transaction related audit objective. The first one is recorded cash disbursement transaction are for the amount of goods or services received and are correctly recorded. Next, cash disbursement transactions are properly included in the accounts payable master file and are correctly summarized. The third objective is recorded cash disbursement are for goods and services actually received. Next, cash disbursement transactions are properly classified. Besides that, existing cash disbursement transactions are recorded. And last but, but not least, Cash disbursement transactions are recorded on the correct dates. Balance related audit objectives. 
Balance-related audit objectives are applied to account balance. Because of the way audits are done, balance-related audit objectives are almost always applied to ending balance in the balance sheet accounts, such as account receivable, inventory, and loan payable. There are nine general objectives of balance-related audit objectives. First, existence. This objective deals with whether the amount included in the financial statement should actually be included. For example, inclusion of an account receivable from a customer in the account receivable trial balance when there is no receivable from that customer violates the existence objective. This objective is the auditor's counterpart to the management assertion of existence or occurrence. Second is completeness. This objective deals with whether all amount that should be included have actually been included. Failure to include an account receivable from a customer in the account receivable trial balance violates the completeness. Next is accuracy. Accuracy refers to amounts being included at the correct arithmetic amount. An inventory item on a client's inventory listing could be wrong because the number of units of inventory on hand was misstated, the unit price was wrong, or the total was incorrectly extended. Accuracy is one part of the valuation or allocation assertion. Fourth is classification. Classification involves, de involves determining whether items on a client's listing are included in the correct accounts. For example, on the accounts receivable listing, receivable must be separated into short term and long term. Classification is also a part of valuation or allocation assertion. Cut off. In testing for cut off, the objective is to determine whether transactions are recorded in the proper period. The transactions that are most likely to be misstated are those recorded near the end of the accounting period. It is proper to think of cut-off test as a part of verifying either the balance sheet accounts or related transactions. But, for convenience, auditors usually perform them as part of auditing balance sheet accounts. Next is detailed tie-in. Account balances on financial statements are supported by details in master files and shadows prepared by clients. The detailed tie-in objective is concerned that the details on list are accurately prepared, correctly added, and agree with the general ledger. Next is realizable value. This objective concerns whether an account balance has been reduced for declines from historical costs to net realizable value. The objective applies only to asset accounts. The number eight objective is rights and obligations. In addition to existing, most assets must be owned before is it is acceptable to include them in the financial statements. Similarly, liabilities must belong to the entity. Rights are always associated with assets and obligations with liabilities. The last one is presentation and disclosure. In fulfilling the presentation and disclosure objective, the auditor tests to make certain that all balance sheet and profit and loss account items and related information are correctly set forth in the financial statement. Presentation and disclosure is closely related to but distinct from classification. Accounting information for balance related audit objective is correctly classified if all information on the on detail schedule supporting an account balance is summarized in the appropriate accounts. The information is correctly disclosed if those account balance and related notes are properly combined, described and presented in the financial statement. According to Brown University, internal control is a process. It is a means to an end, but not an end in itself. Internal control is affected by people. It's not merely policy manuals and forms, but people functioning at every level of the institution. Internal control is geared to the achievement of objectives in several overlapping categories. 
internal control can be expected to provide only reasonable assurance to an institution's leader regarding achievement of operational, financial reporting, and compliance objectives. There are five components of internal control. The first one is control environment. The second one is risk assessment. The third one is control activities. The fourth one is information and communication. And the last one is monitoring. So, there are five fundamental concepts in internal controls. The first one is to provide objective insight. You can't audit your own work without having a definite conflict of interest. Your internal auditor or internal audit team cannot have any operational responsibility to achieve this objective insight. In situations where smaller, companies don't have extra resources to devote to this. It's acceptable to a cross-trained employees in different departments to be able to audit another departments. By providing an independent and unbiased view, the internal audit function adds value to your organizations. The second one is to improve efficiency of operations. By objectively reviewing your organization's policies and procedures, you can receive assurance that you, can, you are doing what your policies and procedures say you are doing and that this processes an adequate in mitigating your unique risk. By continuously monitoring and reviewing your processes, you can identify control recommendations to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of these processes. In turn, allowing your organization to be dependent on processes rather than people. The third one is evaluates risk and protects assets. An internal audit program assists management and stakeholders by identifying and prioritizing risk through a systematic risk assessment. A risk assessment can help to identify any gaps in environment and allow for the remediation plan to take place. Your internal audit program will help you to track and document any changes that have been made to your environment and ensure the mitigation of any found risk. The fourth one is assessors controls. Internal auditing is beneficial because it improves the control environment of the organization by assessing efficiency and operating effectiveness. Are your controls fulfilling their purpose, are they adequate in mitigating risk? Mm, so, the last one is ensures compliance with laws and regulations. By regularly performing an internal audit, you can ensure compliance with any and all relevant laws and regulations. It can also help provide you with peace of mind that you are prepared for your next for your next inter external audit. Gaining client trust and avoiding costly fines associated with non-compliance makes internal auditing an important and worthwhile activity for your organization. A good internal control system does following, controls the risk, operates effectively and efficiently, prevents fraud, measures progress toward your goals, complies with all laws and regulations that apply to your business, proactively identifies potential issues and reactively deals with, the, with them quickly when they occur. For example, Kenya Airlines lost an estimated 21.7 million because of incorrect billing and not charging the correct amount for excess baggage. 
a deficiency in internal control over financial reporting exists when the design or operation of a control does not allow management on employees in the normal course of performing their assigned functions to prevent or detect misstatements on a timely basis. A deficiency in designs exists when a control necessary to meet the control objective is missing and existing control is not properly designed so that even if the control operates as designed, the control objective will not be met. A deficiency in operation exists when a properly designed control does not operate as designed or when the person performing the control does not possess the necessary authority or competence to perform the control effectively. The example of control deficiency is the lack of physical inventory, the lack of overdraft funds monitoring, the lack of timeliness of cash deposits and account reconciliation.